Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, it's Natalie Gruniger here. Welcome to the final episode of 2023. I hope you're all having a wonderful holiday season and are enjoying some well-earned downtime. You may remember that some weeks back I mentioned a new tour company called Simply Tudor Tours. I'll be accompanying their first tour, The Rise and Fall of Anne Boleyn, which will run from the 2nd to the 8th of September 2024. If you'd like to spend six days with me exploring historic sites associated with Anne Boleyn and talking a lot of Tudors, do check out their website for details. They've organised a truly amazing tour for guests, one that will blow the socks off any Anne Boleyn lover. There is, however, only one place left, so do be quick. Find out more and book your place at simplytudortours.com. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the generous listeners who continue to support Talking Tudors on Patreon and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. This really does make a difference. If you love the podcast and you never miss an episode, I invite you to join the Talking Tudors Patreon community. Visit patreon.com slash talking tutors for more information. Join the Talking Tudors patron family to instantly unlock access to exclusive posts, including audio releases and videos. Patrons are also eligible to attend additional monthly live talks and to take part in a member-only book club and enter patron-only monthly giveaways to name but a few of the perks. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, mugs, notebooks, and apparel. Check out all the products at talkingtudors.threadless.com. Now, on to today's episode. I'm thrilled to welcome Lacey Bona Hull back to the podcast to chat about the lives of women from the Wars of the Roses. Lacey is a doctoral candidate and graduate instructor from the United States. She's currently finishing her dissertation and will receive her PhD in 2024 in medieval history. Lacey is passionate about making the past exciting and accessible to a general public, which has inspired her to offer virtual courses on medieval history topics to interested individuals through the online platform Medieval History Academy. Current courses focus on the mystery of the disappearance of the princes in the tower and a survey of the lives and experiences of women in late medieval England. Let's dive straight into our conversation. Welcome back to Talking Tudors, Lacey. How are you? Thank you. I'm good. How are you? I'm well, thank you. I've been looking forward to chatting with you because we we are going to actually venture slightly out of the Tudor period for this conversation. So we're, we're going to be talking about some of the incredible women of the Wars of the Roses. But before we we kind of dive into that, do you want to just say hello to everyone and introduce yourself? I do. Yeah. So hello, my name is Lacey Bonar Hall. This is my second time coming on your podcast. And I'm so excited to be back and talking about a topic that is really near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm currently finishing up a dissertation for my PhD. And a heavy, heavy portion of that dissertation is on medieval women and really the women who helped to set the stage for the Tudor dynasty. So I'm so excited to be chatting about them with you. Oh, I'm so excited as well. And 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 I want to just dive in, but I think what might be a good idea is if you just maybe start by setting the scene for us a little bit and telling us what was happening in England during the period that we now call the Wars of the Roses. Sure. And I will, I'll, I'll try and make this as succinct as possible, but it is a really complicated time period with a lot of switching of sides. There's some deep political history that came into play that really 
started the Wars of the Roses and then pretty much turned England upside down for a period of about 30 years in the late 15th century. But before we get to that, we do have to travel back in time a little bit to the reign of King Edward III. So he ruled about 100 years before we see the Wars of the Roses actually kicking off. He ruled from the year 1327 to 1377, and he was really the last unchallenged king. So he was a Plantagenet king. He was wildly popular. He was very, very successful, and England was very successful under Edward III. The problem with Edward III, which really wasn't even seen as a problem at the time, is that he had a lot of children with his wife, Queen Philippa, and five of his sons actually survived to adulthood. And these five sons all ended up becoming royal dukes, which was new to England at the time. It's really the definition of like seemed like a good idea at the time to Edward uh, in his court. but. The problem that comes into play with having five royal dukes comes with their descendants. The royal dukes were incredibly powerful, really more powerful than almost any of the nobles or magnates had been uh, throughout English history. And because they were the sons of the king, it worked out okay. But when you start getting their sons and daughters and their grandchildren and their great grandchildren um, on the scene, you know, generations later, that's when we start to have some of these issues that really led to the Wars of the Roses. So Edward the third one of his sons uh, was John of Gaunt who of course ended up becoming the Duke of Lancaster so that's the person who uh, we think of as being like the father of the House of Lancaster and then he also had his son Edmund of Langley who ended up becoming the Duke of York and that is the scion um, of the House of York. And of course, the Wars of the Roses ended up being largely between the Lancasters and the Yorks and uh, the, you know, different nobles and noble houses that chose which side they wanted to be loyal to 100 years later. Now, all of this probably wouldn't have happened. We probably wouldn't have had the civil war that came to be known as the Wars of the Roses. We never would have had any Yorkists um, on the throne. We certainly would not have had any Tudors on the throne if Edward III's oldest son had survived long enough to become king. So his oldest son was the Black Prince, another wildly popular historical figure who unfortunately died the year before his father, Edward III, died. So then when Edward III passed away, the crown went to his oldest son's son, who ended up becoming Richard II. Not going to get very much into Richard II, just to give all of the, the listeners just really bird's eye view. He wasn't popular. He was a child king. They're not typically terribly popular. He had a lot of favorites at court. His favorites um, kind of clashed uh, with other favorites and other members of the royal family, and things got pretty ugly under Richard II. He actually ended up being deposed by his cousin, Henry Bolingbroke, who was the son of of John of Gaunt. So he ended up becoming Henry IV, the first Lancastrian king. Things went okay under Henry IV. Things went relatively great um, under his son, Henry V, who again was a really popular monarch, still probably one of England's most popular monarchs today, certainly one of the most popular monarchs from the medieval period. He was the hero of Agincourt. He was set to be the king of both England and France. So England was, of course, embroiled in the Hundred Years' War with France. And Henry V really had this stage set uh, for England to win this thing, right? They they were doing fantastic um, in France under Henry V. And then unfortunately, he died uh, really young, really unexpectedly. And he was, um, of course, replaced by his infant son, Henry VI, who was not even a year old yet by the time uh, that his father died and that he was set to not just be king of England, but to also take over as king of France uh, when his paternal grandfather, the French king, would die soon after uh, Henry V. That didn't end up working out. Henry VI, um, probably a super nice guy pretty much a disaster uh, as a king. He was a really ineffectual ruler, probably a really nice individual, but really didn't have um, any skill when it came to ruling. And it didn't really seem like he had any desire to have any skill uh, when it came to ruling. So he was ruled by some really strong personalities, his uncles, uh, so the royal dukes, his father's younger brothers, and then also his father's half uncles who are the Beauforts. So the children of that relationship between John of Gaunt and Catherine Swinford, who of course 
would go on to have uh, Margaret Beaufort, who's someone who I think most listeners will probably know the name of. So Henry VI was, he kind of led to the Wars of the Roses just himself through his personality. He was really dominated by these different nobles and these nobles hated each other. And really, you need a strong king to be sort of a unifying force when you have such strong personalities in your dukes and, you know, your leading noble families. And Henry VI was not that. That. He was a child uh, for the, of course, the first like really two decades um, of his kingship. But then even when he reached his 20s and when he should have been ruling by himself, he wasn't. He really just didn't have much of a desire to do that. He lost a ton of land in France, pretty much all of the land that his father um, had won. He had lost by, you know, pretty early on uh, in his reign. And England was also sort of plunged into some financial disasters. Uh, His favorites were pretty unpopular with a lot of the leading nobles, especially his closest kinsmen, because Henry VI remained childless for many years. Um, So his closest kinsman was Richard, Duke of York, who was uh, really the only remaining male member of the House of York at this point, and he tried to step in to help Henry VI, but Henry VI really kind of kept him at an arm's length. And this is when we get the setup for the Wars of the Roses. Henry VI had some pretty famous mental health issues. Um, He fell into a stupor, really unresponsive, completely unable to communicate, let alone rule. And Richard, Duke of York, tried to step into this power vacuum, um, and it, it really, things didn't go well. So this is when you have those loyal to Henry VI, the House of Lancaster. You have those loyal to Richard, Duke of York, the House of York, and you have the Lancastrians and the Yorkists really at each other's throat from the mid-15th century pretty much until the end. What a wonderful overview. It's, it's so tricky, isn't it, when there's so many children and so many people are called the same thing <laughs> to keep track it's of tricky. everything. You should, you should see my... Um, my family trees that I just keep in oh. my desk. And it's like, I, I keep adding to them because it's so, there are so many like intermarriages and so yes. many changed alliances. And it's, it's a really confusing, but fascinating time period. I mean, you can't get bored with it. There's just so much to learn and so much to really unravel. Absolutely. It's little wonder that, of course, this is the period that inspires things like Game of Thrones, etc., because it is so yeah. rich, isn't it? It's just such a rich period of history. So, so we're kind of at the threshold of the Wars of the Roses now. So do you want to just tell us a little bit about those key players that we're now going to hear about for the next, you know, sort of half of the century? Yes, definitely. So so we do have to start with Henry VI um, because he was the king. He was meant to be the epitome of power. He really wasn't that much in control of the major decisions that were being made. He had two favorites uh, in particular, the Duke of Suffolk um, and the Duke of Somerset, who really were kind of pulling the strings um, after a while in Henry VI's reign. He was famously said to be better suited to a religious life than a political life. Um, He's more, you know, this idea of like the monk king. Uh, He was probably a super nice person, um, a really nice individual, but just really didn't have the qualities that you needed in a strong king, which is what England really needed at the time, um, especially after the the surprising and really devastating death of Henry V, which Henry V had done such a good job uniting the country that if there was ever a time to have a child king, it really would have been after him because he was such a almost universally loved ruler. I mean, he was really successful. No one could doubt, you know, what he had brought to the table. But because Henry VI, uh, his son, was so young and was dominated by these strong personalities for so long. He really lacked any inability to have any like firm decision making skills. And he really he didn't even really seem to have very many firm opinions. He was someone who was easily influenced uh, by these favorites. And these favorites, like I said, weren't super popular with the more established members of the nobility. When you have that happening, it's just kind of a recipe for disaster. And then when you add to that, a king who has a mental breakdown to where he is bedridden, he's 
largely unresponsive. I mean, they couldn't even get him to to talk, let alone to actually do any important decisions um, or to make any important decisions or to run the government. And when that happened, I mean, it was over a year that he was completely incapacitated. And England was threatened with just falling into complete and total disrepair. So when Henry VI is laying stuck in his bedchambers from mid-1453 to Christmas Day 1454, so a long time for England to effectively be without a king. This is when we see one of the other main uh, people, one of the key personalities, which is Richard, Duke of York, step in. So he had largely been considered to be Henry's heir presumptive because Henry was childless for so many years. And there was no guarantee, um, even when his wife became pregnant, there was, of course, no guarantee that that baby would be a male. So the Duke of York, he really tried to step up. It's hard to kind of to parse out their motivations. It's hard to know if he really did have any sort of plans for the throne or if he was really just concerned about the state of England at the time and he, you know, wanted to take a bigger role in politics. But he didn't get along with Henry VI Queen and he didn't get along uh, with Henry VI favorite, um, especially Somerset, who was kind of York's sworn enemy. So things weren't looking too great uh, for the Duke of York when he tried to step in. He did become Lord Protector. According to, to most people, England was ruled pretty well when York was Lord Protector while Henry VI was incapacitated. But when Henry VI woke up, um, which one historian described as being the worst thing that could have happened to England, and I think many people uh, would agree with that, when, Hen when Henry VI woke up on Christmas Day, 1454, he dismissed York, he brought all of his favorites back, and it was just, it, things sort of returned to the status quo. Things weren't functioning well. People were nervous about if he was going to stay recovered or if he was going to have another mental break, which he eventually would go on to do. But it helped to set the stage for the wars actually beginning. So five months after Henry VI woke up is when we have what is largely seen as being the first actual battle of the Wars of the Roses, which is the first battle of St. Albans. This battle was fought, of course, between the House of York and the House of Lancaster, but someone who really came into play um, in these early years of the actual fighting is Warwick, the kingmaker, who was the nephew by marriage to the Duke of York. He threw all of his support behind the House of York, and um, he was an incredible commander. He was incredibly skilled politically. He was charming. He had a lot of charisma on paper, you know, not the best person, but certainly not someone who you would want to mess with. And he was very successful. So he helped to bring the House of York um, to into power. So they ended up taking Henry VI. We have the House of York being in control. Then we have the Lancastrians going back into control. And they just keep really switching sides of who is running this country for several years. And Sure, there was a little bit of downtime um, in between, but we have these battles popping up with pretty regular um, occurrences where we have people switching sides. We have these noble families changing their alliances. No one really knows who they can trust at this time because sometimes, you know, Henry VI might be your man. He might be the person who can really benefit you. And then other times it's more Richard um, or the kingmaker who, you know, is who you would want to go to to try and advance your family. So a lot of layers for the Wars of the Roses, a lot of really intense personalities. And then the one more sort of weak personality was unfortunately the king. Yes, never a good thing, is it? It opens up the, the floodgates, I think, for people to, for that those power struggles that you've been talking about. So we've got some pretty big personalities in terms of the men that are taking part in this in these Wars of the Roses. Let's now talk a little bit about the women, because of course there were women involved during this period. So what role did they play, um, Lacey? Yes. So so the women were actually really heavily involved throughout the Wars of the Roses. It's not really something that is typically thought of. Most of the time people are thinking about the battles of the Wars of the Roses, which of course would have been men's arena, aside from um, Margaret of Anjou, who I definitely want to talk about. Um, she took, you know, more of a 
controlling role uh, when it came to actual politics and the battles. But these high political positions were mostly held by men. And throughout the historiography of the Wars of the Roses, most historians have, up until really the last couple of decades, they have focused on the male point of view for this time period uh, in medieval history. But what we're starting to realize with more recent research is that there were women who were really pulling the strings behind the scenes. They're not always as visible. They're not as regularly remembered as these men's names. I mean, most people, if you're interested in medieval history, you will have heard of Henry VI. You will have heard of the Duke of York. You will have heard of the Kingmaker um, if you're you know, interested in this time period. But some of these women are less often remembered. If they are remembered, it's usually for pretty negative reasons. So three of the main players would be Margaret of Anjou, who was, of course, Henry VI queen. She is largely blamed uh, for the Wars of the Roses, even starting, which is pretty unfair um, because, you know, obviously, no matter who the queen was at the time, the wars were pretty much bound to happen uh, just because so many families had conflicting interests and Henry VI was not a terribly uh, unifying king. You have Margaret Beaufort, who is, for some reason today, she's really reduced to being a religious fanatic um, and kind of like a mom who was just so determined to have her son, Henry VII, placed on the throne that she was just willing to do anything um, and to get rid of anyone. I mean, she's regularly blamed for the disappearance of the princes in the tower, even though there is no historical evidence that she was involved or even could have been involved uh, with their disappearance. But it's it's how she is seen today. She's largely villainized. And then Elizabeth Woodville is uh, the Yorkist queen, a pretty popular queen at the time, but she's kind of reduced in history to being, oftentimes she's accused of being a witch. She is typically accused of being an upstart, um, being someone who's selfish, who promoted her family over the interests of the realm. And at best, she's reduced to being pretty mm-hmm. and someone that Edward IV like to look at. And I think that's really unfair. I think that's unfair for these three women in particular to reduce them to these kind of negative qualities. But I think it's unfair to women of the period as a whole to just sort of write them off and to say that they weren't actually involved. Women were involved. They were just involved in ways that are different than I think how we typically view the time period of the Wars of the Roses, because it is dominated by these battles. They were brutal battles. It's understandable uh, that people want to talk about the battles. I mean, we have England's bloodiest battle uh, on English soil that happened during the Wars of the Roses. And I mean, you do have family members killing family members, which is just kind of unfathomable to us to think about today. So I understand why that is at the forefront of most people's minds when they're thinking about this time period. But what I see as being equally as interesting is thinking about these personal relationships, thinking about the the women who were using their friendships, they were using their marriages, they were using their family members to try and get what they wanted or to try and on a very basic level, even just keep their families safe and keep their families alive. So women at this time period, they had really complex relationships, much like how we have complex relationships now. They were in pretty constant communication with the men in their lives, but also with other women in their lives. And sometimes we can see how women's loyalties crossed lines that had been blurred during the Wars of the Roses that the men in their lives didn't cross. So we have some examples of some women who were Lancastrians who had good relationships with Yorkists. We have several Yorkist women who had working relationships with the Lancastrians. And I think it's a really unique area of being able to study these personal relationships and what they might tell us about this really complex time period in a way that we don't often see when we're studying the men. Because they're sure their alliances shifted. Um, You have people like Thomas Stanley, who you just never quite knew uh, what side he was on. But for the women, this work was done behind the scenes. We have to look at letters. We have to look at marriages that women arranged. We have to look at wardships. 
that women were in charge of, where they would take children from lesser noble houses or sometimes the even the house of uh, York or the house of Lancaster itself, and they would take them into their own household. And then we start to see some some influences there, right? We start to see where these family relationships and these friendships can help to mold relationships throughout the Wars of the Roses that can have just as big of impacts on the outcome of the war as the battles themselves did. So I do think that we need to look at these personal relationships. We need to take the women into consideration, even if maybe they're not at the forefront of some of these more typical sources that we usually look at when we're studying the Wars of the Roses. But if we think about these, I mean, the Wars of the Roses, it was fought over these intensely personal relationships and allegiances. And this is where women really found their strength. I think another important thing to look into with the Wars of the Roses and the the women who featured prominently is the role of reputation that the impact that reputation and especially that sexuality and that rumors could have on these women and then especially their sons. We have a lot um, of accusations of women having sexual affairs at this time period where the heir to the throne is maybe not legitimate. Maybe the heir isn't the son of the man who he actually thinks he's the son to. We see a lot of um, sexualizing of these really powerful women in a way that we just don't really see with men, but in a way that is interesting because it was also used as propaganda. We have I mean, song lyrics and poems about these really monstrous women uh, who couldn't control their urges and now look at what they've thrown um, England into. So I do think that there's something to be said for studying more of the women's side of things if we want to actually get a fuller idea of the Wars of the Roses and the impact that it had on English society. Oh, I completely, completely 100% agree with you, Lacey. And I think those personal relationships and those networks that you've been talking about are completely and utterly fascinating. So I'm so glad you've spoken about them. So you've mentioned three very prominent women there, Margaret of Anjou, Margaret Beaufort and Elizabeth Woodville. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about these women? I do. And please cut me off if I talk too much, especially about um, Elizabeth Woodville. I'm sort of uh, an Elizabeth Woodville fangirl. And I think I could probably talk about her for about 12 days without (laughs) running out of things to say. But I will start with Margaret of Anjou because she really is key to the Wars of the Roses. She is definitely the leading woman from the House of Lancaster by the time the war is actually started, if not just the leading individual for the House of Lancaster because Henry VI was incapacitated for so much time and because even when he uh, had all of his faculties and he you know, was operating at his typical level, he still wasn't very heavily involved um, personally with some of these instances of political antri- intrigue, but Margaret was. Margaret was very much in the middle of things. She was 15 years old when she married uh, Henry VI in 1445. And her marriage was really sort of like a peace offering between England and France to help bring about a truce in the Hundred Years' War, which made her already incredibly unpopular. Before anyone even met this young 15-year-old French girl, she was already the subject of a lot of animosity. Just because so many people at Henry VI court didn't want the war to end. They didn't want to make any concessions to the French. They very much still believed that they could um, win the Hundred Years' War. And then there were other people at the court who very much wanted to bring about a truce. And they're the ones who organized this marriage. They're the ones who actually brought Queen Margaret over. So when she arrived, the odds were really stacked against her. She was launched into the middle of a political firestorm. And she was used to women being involved in politics. In France, in her family, women were, they took a more active role in politics. She didn't quite catch the memo that most English queens weren't terribly political and that they hadn't been since um, Queen Isabella, who famously was not uh, much beloved by the uh, English people. She wasn't seen as doing very much good aside from giving birth to Edward III. Um, So when Margaret 
started to take a more active role in politics, it really turned off a lot of people. It made her a lot of enemies. But she also had a lot of friends at court. She had a lot of allies. She had a lot of favorites. She had a lot of people uh, who she really tried to raise up. She tried to work with them politically to try and secure a future for the House of Lancaster. And this was hard to do because she remained childless for several years uh, into her marriage. If she had fallen pregnant early on um, in her marriage, then I think judging by what had happened in the past, the English people probably would have supported her more. But at the time, women were blamed um, for lack of children instead of men, especially when that man would be the king. Uh, So when she did struggle to fall pregnant, she was blamed for a lot of that too. So she had a lot of pushback being political. She had a lot of pushback for not having a child. She teamed up uh, with the Duke of Somerset, who was certainly her favorite and was one of Henry VI's favorites as well. Uh, He was a Beaufort, so he was family to Henry VI, but he was also really wildly unpopular. He's that guy who was the enemy of the Duke of York. I mean, the two just absolutely hated each other. And Margaret and Somerset had a really good relationship. Some would say maybe too good of a relationship. When she finally did fall pregnant after being married for eight years, there were whispers around court uh, and around the country that Somerset might have actually been the child's father instead of Henry VI. Um, Somerset actually, just as an interesting tangent, it wasn't the first time that he was accused of maybe impregnating an English queen. He had been accused of getting uh, Catherine de Valois, so Henry VI's mother, getting her pregnant um, a couple decades earlier. And there were rumors that her son, her, um, so not Henry VI, of course, but Edmund Tudor was actually Somerset's son, um, instead of being the son of Owen Tudor, who, you know, Edmund would, of course, go on to marry Margaret Beaufort. So if if that was the case, and there are some historians who really do believe that Somerset uh, is actually the father of the Tudor dynasty instead of Owen Tudor. If that was the case, then Margaret Beaufort accidentally married her first cousin, which could have uh, come into play later with some fertility issues that we see popping up uh, with Henry VIII. So it's very much something uh, that is unproven. There isn't very much evidence, but there are some historians who think that it might actually have been the case and that Catherine then married Owen Tudor um, to kind of try and cover her tracks a little bit with that. Now that's up for debate. Um, And so is Somerset being the father of Margaret of Anjou's unborn baby. I don't think it's likely uh, to have been the case, but people at the time kind of grabbed a hold of it. And the House of York certainly grabbed a hold of this. They kind of perpetuated this rumor for years and years, even after the child was born, that maybe the baby wasn't actually Henry VI, that the baby wasn't even a Lancastrian. It it wasn't uh, the heir to the throne. And the House of York did this to try and discredit that child so that instead the Duke of York would end up staying um, as heir to Henry VI instead of Henry VI's own son, which is kind of dirty, um, but was very much just how things tended to work back then. And Margaret of Anjou, unfortunately, uh, had to deal with the brunt of that. Something that also probably didn't help uh, in that case is that when she was pregnant, she had told Henry VI, um, he knew that she was pregnant, but he pretty quickly after hearing the news fell into that unresponsive state where he was just really catatonic, right? Like he was, he was bedridden. Um, He wasn't able uh, to talk. He wasn't able to acknowledge this child uh, when the child was born. And when supposedly when Margaret of Anjou showed him the baby when he woke up um, in very late 1454, he supposedly was very excited, but did say that he knew that that baby was the child of the Holy Spirit. And you know that Margaret just had to be like, I know you meant this as a compliment, but if you knew the rumors uh, that were being spread about me and this child, 
child, you know, you probably wouldn't have said that, but he did. Um, and she, you know, was nothing but loyal to that child uh, throughout Prince Edward's life. And Henry VI certainly recognized him as being his son. And there wasn't too much uh, conversation on the Lancastrian th- side of things about that baby's parentage, but there, there were those discussions uh, on the Yorkist side of things. So when Henry VI did wake back up and things um, started to really escalate with the Wars of the Roses. This is when we see Margaret of Anjou needing to step in uh, for the Lancastrian side of things politically. And she really takes a very prominent role. Um, She ends up becoming an enemy also um, of the Duke of York. And a lot of times you have the Duke of York and Margaret of Anjou just pretty much um, at each other's throats on and off the battlefield. There wasn't very much love lost. Uh, Margaret Beaufort is another woman who is a very prominent uh, key figure to come out of this time period. She is someone whose life was just completely turned upside down by the Wars of the Roses. She, of course, had married Edmund Tudor um, pretty soon after Henry VI had woken up. So they got married right near the end of 1455. She famously was 12 years old. Um, Edmund Tudor was 25 years old, but he was the half-brother to the king. So he was an incredibly important person. She was one of the descendants of John of Gaunt. So she was an incredibly important person. They were both very staunch Lancastrians. The two of them married. They didn't lose much time um, trying to have an heir, which was done for different purposes, not the least of which being that Henry VI only had one child. So the heir to the throne um, was a baby, not entirely stable. So if Margaret Beaufort had a child with the king's half-brother, then maybe that baby um, could step into the position of being heir if something had happened to Margaret of Anjou and Henry VI baby. But unfortunately, she uh, lost her husband while she was pregnant. So Edmund Tudor was sent to Wales. Um, He was captured there by a Yorkist. He was imprisoned and he ended up catching the bubonic plague. And he died right around a year to the day from their wedding. She, of course, would go on to um, have that baby who would be the future Henry VII, her only child uh, that she would have, probably because she had a really difficult labor. Neither Margaret nor her baby were expected to survive. She wasn't just 13 years old uh, when she gave birth, but she was also just remarkably small, really small of stature. They knew um, that it was going to be a really difficult delivery for her, but she did what she did best. Uh, She powered through, she made it happen, um, and she ended up giving birth to the son that she would really dedicate the rest of her life to keeping safe because he was a very prominent member of the Lancastrian dynasty. So when her husband died, um, she ended up marrying another staunch Lancastrian, unsurprisingly. She ended up marrying the son of the Duke of Buckingham. So she um, had a really loving relationship with him for the most part. And he really helped her to navigate what were some extremely dangerous waters for her because she was a descendant of John of Gaunt. She was someone um, who was looked at as being a really important political figure, both her, herself, um, and her infant son. The other woman that I really wanted to talk about, uh, who's a key figure, is Elizabeth Woodville, who, of course, is best known for being the wife of Edward IV, the first Yorkist king. But before that, she was a Lancastrian. She was a diehard Lancastrian. Her parents were diehard Lancastrians. She was the daughter of uh, Jaquetta of Luxembourg, who was the widow. This is where my family trees would really come in handy. Um, she was the widow of the Duke of Bedford, who was the brother to Henry V. So Henry VI's uncle. She was his widow. She was very close uh, with Margaret of Anjou. Elizabeth Woodville was also likely very close with Margaret of Anjou. Jaquetta, quite scandalously, uh, married Richard Woodville, who was just a lowly knight. She she married him pretty fast um, after Bedford died as well. It wasn't looked upon kindly, um, but Richard Woodville was also a very loyal Lancastrian. So, you know, things could have been worse. So Jaquetta and Richard 
and their children were all very dedicated to the Lancastrian cause. Elizabeth, of course, married a Lancastrian knight, um, John Gray. He ended up, unfortunately, dying um, at the Second Battle of St. Albans, where he was, of course, fighting for the Lancastrians. And this is when we get the widowed, young, beautiful Elizabeth Woodville, who, according to legend, was standing in the forest holding the hands of her two young sons when who should ride by but Edward IV, the king. Um, and even though he was the Yorkist king, she was very destitute and just really needing um, financial support because her husband had been killed. Her parents were Lancastrians, so they, you know, had lost some of their clout that they had at Henry VI court. And Edward IV allegedly fell madly in love with her, couldn't imagine um, his life without her, and According to which story you read, um, there was a dagger involved where Edward said, I have to have you. Uh, and he was a known womanizer. Edward IV, love him, but he was known for mistreatment, I think we would say now, of women. He kind of used them uh, for what he wanted and then discarded them uh, to other courtiers, allegedly. And Elizabeth Woodville knew that. So when he supposedly told her that he was in love with her. She, very Anne Boleyn-esque, said, I will not um, be your mistress and I'm not good enough to be your queen because she, you know, was a commoner. Um, and then supposedly she threatened to use the dagger on herself if he, you know, wouldn't back off a little bit. And instead he said, well, then I'll just marry you. Is that um, accurate? I don't know. Hard to tell, but it makes for one heck of a story. Um, should be picked up by Hollywood. You know, it's very dramatic. Um, but the two of them supposedly had a secret wedding on May Day, which was attended um, by like Jaquetta, uh, Elizabeth's mom, and really not very many other people, which would, of course, come back to bite her um, a bit later when her brother-in-law came to the throne as Richard III. But at the time, uh, things seemed great, right? Elizabeth Woodville became queen. She, because she was a commoner, um, was not a terribly popular queen with some members of the nobility, especially the kingmaker, who had really put Edward IV on the throne. And her family were old enemies um, of the kingmaker. So things were really rocky for her politically, even though they might have been going okay for her personally. From what we can tell, she did have a pretty good relationship um, with Edward IV. He didn't stop womanizing, but I don't think she expected him to. Um, so the two of them, you know, did okay. But she is still a key player, not just because she's the queen, but because she and her family were the subject of a lot of animosity with the kingmaker um, and with Edward IV's younger brother, the Duke of Clarence. So Elizabeth Woodville's remarkable not just because she was a commoner who uh, married Edward IV, which, you know, it wasn't a thing for commoners to marry kings, but she was also remarkable because she is sort of like a warrior uh, from this, this time period. Her father and her brother were both executed um, by Warwick, uh, the kingmaker, which is kind of hard to wrap your mind around the queen's father and brother being killed by one of her husband's subjects, which is sort of wild. Um, but she had to put up with that. She and her mother were accused of using witchcraft to ensnare um, Edward IV, which just like these accusations of immoral sexuality, witchcraft was also something that was just typically uh, launched at noble women at the time. But she, you know, gave birth to Edward's heir when she was in sanctuary, literally had to run uh, for her life and the lives of her daughters um, and her unborn baby from the kingmaker because uh, he had chased Edward IV and her brother, Anthony Woodville and Richard III, um, Edward IV's youngest brother, they had to flee abroad because the kingmaker was so intent on removing Edward IV from the throne, who he put there in the first place, and replacing him um, with Henry VI. And she, you know, she didn't have things easy. Um, she, of course, when Edward IV came back to rule and he ended up killing uh, the kingmaker in battle and reconciling with Clarence, which probably wasn't a good uh, decision we can tell later on because of Elizabeth Woodville. But um, things, you know, did get better for her for a bit. And then, of course, we have the 
early death of Edward IV, we have the princes in the tower who are Elizabeth Woodville's two youngest sons who go missing. Um, and, you know, we're still trying to figure out 500 years later, what the heck happened to those kids? And she uh, loses her second oldest son, Richard III, has him killed. I mean, she went through um, an incredible amount. And I think if we can find, if we can really point at someone uh, who was met with a lot of challenges from the Wars of the Roses, Elizabeth Woodville certainly has to be on that list. Margaret of Anjou too. Neither of them had it easy for being two queens, especially. But Elizabeth Woodville's life, I think, is a good example of just how dangerous this time period was and really how devastating this time period was. I think it's easy 500 years on to just look at these people as being names on paper and look at these battles as just being certain dates and a certain number of casualties. But if you do try and put yourself in the shoes of these women and men who were alive at this time period, I mean, it was just an intensely dangerous and unstable uh, time to be alive. If even the queen's father and brother are being murdered. You know, it's not the easiest time, I think, to to live in historically. No, absolutely not. And I, I think I'm always amazed by the the incredible resilience that these women showed and also their resourcefulness. The, the, the way they just kept going is just inspirational and mind-boggling all at the same time. So so thank you for, for giving us a sort of more of an introduction to these incredible women. But I'm wondering if during your research, you came across any perhaps lesser known women that you think deserve closer study. Yes, there, there are a lot. Um, I will say pretty much any time you come across a woman in the sources, she has a really interesting story. And just because of the nature of the time, pretty much any woman um, who is in any of these families and the upper nobility, they have a story that's worth reading. If you're interested in learning more about the politics and more about just the day-to-day -day life and impact that the Wars of the Roses had on these people. But I will say... One person in particular who I think needs more attention um, is Cecily Neville. So Cecily was the mother of Edward IV and the Duke of Clarence and Richard III. She was born um, a Lancastrian. She was the daughter of the daughter of John of Gaunt, so the Duke of Lancaster, from his relationship uh, with Catherine Swinford. So there were some allegations of illegitimacy in Cecily's background. But by the time she really comes into her own, her mother had been legitimized. She was an incredibly powerful individual, not just because of her family background, but just also because of her uh, and her personality. She is endlessly fascinating. She went from being a very staunch Lancastrian to being the matriarch of the House of York. So she ended up marrying Richard, Duke of York, who I've been talking about um, a lot. And the two of them had a good relationship. They were really like a 15th century power couple, I think, um, is is what we would call them if we were using modern words. I mean, the two of them were kind of unstoppable. She knew how to use her personality and her personal connections to her advantage. So when her husband was having some issues with Henry VI, she would go in person and she would, you know, beg Henry VI for forgiveness. Her sons and her husband um, have fled abroad because it was too dangerous for them to be in England. She stayed and she went to court and she begged the king um, to have mercy on her. And he did. He shouldn't have. She was very powerful uh, in her own right, but she was able to convince Henry VI to forgive her and to let her be kept under the custody of one of her sisters who had stayed Lancastrian. But even her being under house arrest, uh, didn't last for very long. She was known in the early years of Edward IV's reign. She was known as sort of being like the second monarch. She made sure that everyone knew that her husband should have been king and she should have been queen um, if her husband hadn't been killed in battle and then his claim taken up by their son, Edward IV. But she had a very good relationship with Edward IV until he married um, Elizabeth Woodville. She, Cecily and Elizabeth, 
It kind of butted heads a bit um, just because Elizabeth was so lowborn and Cecily was very proud um, of her own heritage and then the family that she married into. She was known as Proud Sis. Um, that was her nickname. So it was her pride was something that people, uh, even at the time, really remarked upon. And she, we don't think she probably attended Elizabeth Woodville's coronation. She kept her lodgings of the Queen's apartment, even when Elizabeth Woodville was officially crowned queen and Edward IV had to build um, Elizabeth her own chambers, which is just hilarious um, to me, probably not hilarious at the time, but really funny to think about Edward IV trying to navigate these two really powerful women in his life, his mother and his wife. Um, it's sort of like the evil mother-in-law um, <laughs> trope, I think that we get like in a lot of movies and stuff today, but Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville were living it. Um, Cecily wasn't, she just wasn't a fan and she let that be known. She went so far, allegedly, as to say that Edward IV was actually a bastard and that she had gotten pregnant with an archer in France and that that was his real father. Is that true? I don't know. Um, but it's, it does, I think, speak to this theme um, of women's uncontrolled sexuality that it was believed at the time that Cecily Neville would have said that about herself because she was so mad that her son married um, without her permission. And then the other woman that I'll say I think is really worth uh, more looking into is her daughter, uh, Margaret of York, who ended up becoming Margaret of Burgundy. So Cecily and Margaret were both very close uh, to Edward IV and Richard III uh, when he came to the throne. There has been so much talk recently about the princes in the tower, of course, um, for anyone who's interested in that time period, it's kind of hard to escape the princes in the tower discourse right now. And I think one really good thing about that really coming into uh, its own and having more light shed on it is that more people are talking about Margaret of Burgundy and the possible role that she might have played in the disappearance um, of the princes or, you know, the immediate aftermath of that disappearance. She was an incredibly powerful individual. She was really close, especially with Richard III. Um, the two of them, you know, wrote letters back and forth. I was lucky enough on my most recent uh, research trip to London that I was able to pull some of the letters that Richard III had written to um, his mother and then some payments that were made from Richard III to Margaret right at the time of the prince's um, disappearance, which is interesting. Massive payments, like equivalent to the crown's yearly income wow. um, was sent to, yeah, to, to Margaret um, or to someone, you know, in that area. But I think a lot of people agree that it's likely Margaret and her court um, that these payments might have gone to. And then, of course, you get the question of what was she doing? Um, yes. and <laughs> might she have known? Because so many people, and I will not talk about the princes in the tower a ton, um, because it's another one of my, you know, I'm I'm an Elizabeth Woodville girl. So I'm, of course, passionate um, about the fate of her boys. But I think it's something that people don't really think about when they think about the princes in the tower are the women that were involved in their life. I think there's a very surface level understanding um, of Elizabeth Woodville being their mother and being concerned for them. I think there isn't very much thought that's put into Cecily Neville being their grandmother or Margaret of Burgundy being their aunt and being very close, a very close family. And she stayed really close with her brothers throughout their lives. So I do think, I think there's uh, a lot of work to be done on those two women, which is exciting. I hope to do um, some of that work myself, but I do think that they are two women who are worth looking into in their own right, um, but then also to better understand the complexities of the Wars of the Roses and those really kind of big question mark events that happened um, at the end of Edward IV's life. Well, I might have to try and lure you back for an episode on the princes in the tower <laughs> because, yes, that's the, the hot topic at the moment. I haven't touched it just yet. I'm still oh, trying to, <laughs> to um, digest it, there's everything. So, oh, there's so much yes, to unpack. There, um, it so was, much. Uh, there was a lot already and then now there's more, which yeah. isn't a problem. Yeah. It's really exciting. It's just that talk about a complex issue. Yes. With anything from the Wars of the Roses is going to be complex because it was complex at the time and it's really complex complex to us 500 years on because we've lost so much.
Yeah, absolutely. And so just to bring start bringing our conversation to an end, what has your work revealed about the relationship then between women and power at this time? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's just so much, I think there's so much to uncover um, about women and what their avenues to power actually look like. Most of their avenues to power were not traditional. You do have Margaret of Anjou, who might have had access to more of those traditional um, ways that men sought power throughout the Wars of the Roses. But for women, you really have to look into, I think, those personal relationships. I am a big advocate for trying to uncover women's uh, friendships in the Middle Ages. There has not been much work done on women's friendship and women's personal relationships, even though these friendships could really define the fate of a nation. You know, not to be dramatic, but the reason why we have the Tudors is largely because of Margaret Beaufort and Elizabeth Woodville being able to cross that divide um, that had kept them apart for so long and really establish what's at least a working relationship, um, if not a friendship, to combine their two families to bring about the Tudors and to put an end to the Wars of the Roses. I mean, it took two women to end this thing. And I think that's something that people, they aren't, it's, it doesn't come to the forefront of your mind when you're thinking about the Wars of the Roses. You don't think friendships. You don't think um, sibling relationships. You don't think mother-son or mother-daughter relationships. But to me, these are just as integral as the battles. They mean just as much as the politics because they were political. They were personal, but they were also very political alliances that these women made and that they helped to, to really form um, the outcome of this war or this series um, of wars, you know, however you want to, to phrase it. But if you don't look at these women and their relationships and their contributions, I mean, you're missing 50% of the population. You're missing a lot of the really important action during the medieval period um, in general, but certainly during the Wars of the Roses. And I will give one quick example, Natalie, because I of don't want to yes. uh, keep you for too long. But Cecily Neville, who was married to the Duke of York. So, you know, very much Yorkist through and through um, by the time she had her children and by the time the Wars of the Roses really kicked off. She had a decent relationship um, with Margaret of Anjou, who, of course, is Henry VI queen. Margaret um, hated Cecily's husband. Cecily's husband hated Margaret. You know, he didn't get along uh, with Margaret's husband, the king. But Cecily and Margaret were able to get along to the point where Cecily is one of the few women who were asked to attend Margaret's churching after she had her child. And we have a letter that I think is in the Huntington Library um, here in California in the States. And it was written from Cecily to Margaret when Margaret was pregnant. Margaret had just stayed with Cecily um, at her house when she was pregnant with Henry the sixth child. And Cecily writes to her and says, you know, I hope you can convince your husband to forgive my husband because my husband's really sad um, that, you know, that he has gotten on the king's bad side. And I hope our relationship can help to bring about a reconciliation. And she's talking about her own recent birth that she had given um, to Richard III, which was a very difficult birth. He was supposed to have been a breech baby. Um, so, you know, was very unsafe uh, for Cecily to even deliver him. And it obviously left some emotional scars. And she's talking about this with Margaret. From what we can tell, they were friends. I mean, she was there maybe not when Margaret gave birth, but she was certainly there for Margaret's churching ceremony, which, which at the time, you know, was one of the most major ceremonies in a woman's life, uh, let alone a queen's life. And the two of them were able to really work past this Lancaster York divide in a way that we don't really see if we're not actively looking for that more, I don't want to say a womanly um, relationship, because I don't think it was. I think, you know, there were plenty of personal relationships that men were developing at this time. But I just don't think that women's relationships are what we tend to look at when we're looking at the Wars of the Roses. And then we're missing a whole lot of context and some really interesting context um, as well. So that's that's been my, my big takeaway um, of doing a dissertation uh, on medieval women and then, you know, just studying medieval women uh, for my own career is that we have to look at avenues of power that we might not traditionally look at, but they can reveal 
some really fascinating insights. Oh, I'm so glad you shared that example. I hadn't heard of that before. And that's really, really intriguing, actually. So Lacey, obviously, you feel very passionate about women's history and the fact that we need to look at these relationships and, and study them further. But there are obviously challenges when it comes to writing about women's history. What have you found to be kind of the, the most challenging parts of this work? Yeah, there there are actually a lot of challenges. I like to think that it keeps it fun um, because nothing's really boring. You have to work pretty hard to uncover women in a lot of these sources. The medieval period, even though women, they did have certain uh, avenues where they could access power, they certainly had complex lives. Um, they were, you know, full individuals. They were active in every realm of life um, that, that we could, you know, imagine. But a lot of the sources that we have are still really misogynistic. Um, the Middle Ages were not, at least the people writing these sources weren't progressive uh, when it came to women. They were not typically big advocates um, of women. Instead, they kind of reduce women to two different categories. So you have women as exemplars. They are, were either very, very good women or very, very bad women. And there isn't very much in between when it comes to these actual medieval sources. You have women who were great and they were typically virgins. And then you have women who were really demonized um, and sort of like problematic um, and shoved to the margins of society. And that was everyone else. Whereas in reality, women did occupy a gray area. They weren't typically um, entirely perfect um, or, you know, entirely bad. Instead, they were just real people. They had their own opinions. They had their own goals. They had motivations. And that's something that is a little bit more difficult to uncover from the source material, especially when you're looking at um, source material that has been printed and that is easily accessible. If you have the luxury to actually go into the archives where you can start to pull these more personal letters that some of them have been printed, many of them haven't been, then you do get to start, you start to get a little bit more of an idea of women's actual lives um, and what, you know, they actually saw as being important to them and what they were actually doing. If you're looking at the sources from the Middle Ages that were written by men, a lot of that is lost in translation. I think it's still doable um, to, to try and look at those sources and to read them from a woman's point of view, which is sort of what I do uh, for my dissertation, but it is it is more difficult. It's also difficult because really up until about 50 years ago, historians weren't super interested in uncovering women's experiences. You have a couple people here and there um, in like the 1920s, 1930s who were looking at medieval women, but by and large, it didn't become a super popular topic of study for historians until like the 50s and 60s. So there is a lot of opportunity there. There's a lot of possibility for people who are interested in doing this type of work, this type of history, and this type of research. But what you get when you're looking at these secondary sources is oftentimes they don't think about women. Women don't factor in. Um, there are a lot of books out there that you could get on the Wars of the Roses that will mention maybe Margaret of Anjou. We'll mention Elizabeth Woodville, but just in a very surface level um, way of covering these women. They aren't going to talk about other women uh, who weren't queens, just because so many uh, historians just traditionally haven't approached this time period uh, from the viewpoint of women. So that can be a good thing because there is a lot to do. There's a lot to uncover. It's really fun. But it can also be a negative thing because it can kind of let these myths uh, perpetuate themselves just because there, there really isn't that work done. Um, thinking about Margaret Beaufort uh, as an example, Nicola Tallis has that fantastic biography on Margaret. But other than that, before Nicola came along, there really wasn't much work um, done on Margaret Beaufort by historians. A lot of people's, and even still now, a lot of people's perceptions of Margaret Beaufort come from historical fiction, um, if anything. And that can be, historical fiction's awesome. It's great. Um, it gets people interested in the subject, but sometimes it just doesn't portray people uh, in an accurate way. And I think that's certainly been the case uh, for I call her Maggie B uh, in my head, so it's hard for me to not call her that, but um, for Margaret Beaufort. Uh, and that's, you know, that's when you have historians stepping in and and we're trying to uncover these women's lives. And Nicola does a fantastic job of that. She sure does. I love her book on Lady Jane Grey as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amazing work. So 
Just to finish up, one more question for you. I know I have we have a lot of listeners that are interested in recovering women's stories from the past, which is wonderful. So I was just wondering if maybe just as a nice way to end, you could give us just a few of your kind of top tips for people who are interested in writing about women from the past. Yes, I can do that. I've been doing this um, for about a decade now. So I feel like it's not even like second nature to me now. This is just my nature. But if you're interested in in uncovering uh, the history of women from the medieval period and also from the Tudor period, you're going to have to read your sources against the grain. And that goes for primary sources. So that goes for sources that were written at the time. And it also goes for a lot of these secondary sources. You have to really dig to find women in a lot of the sources. And then sometimes you can find women being talked about in a very negative and historically inaccurate way in both primary and secondary sources. So if you're wanting to get into women's history or gender history, you have to read these sources with an eye to what might be missing or what might be untrue um, and what might be colored by the author or the historian's bias. And that goes for both medieval authors and modern authors, right? We all bring um, something to the table when we're doing this work, when we're doing this research, maybe even when we're uh, choosing our topics, but it can be really exacerbated when you're looking at women's history, just because it is, unfortunately, um, a newer field. You know, it's something that wasn't really doesn't have the benefit of a long history uh, to it because it's something that people are just more recently being interested in. But it also opens up a lot of opportunities. Like I said, it's a very fun um, field to be involved in. And I think it's really rewarding. For me, um, as someone who is really passionate about kind of rescuing these women from the depths of uh, the historical unknown um, or the depths of maybe worse historical misunderstanding. It's really rewarding to get to talk about these women somewhere like your podcast. Um, I've developed a virtual course on women in the Middle Ages where we try and we pluck these women um, out of the pages of history and I really try and bring them to life. And that's something that I think you you can certainly do um, in women's history. I think you can try and read these medieval sources or Tudor sources with an eye to how women would have read them at the time. What are they communicating to women? And then what might women have actually taken away uh, from these sources? Because you can't take anything at face value um, when it's written for women uh, in the Middle Ages, because most of it Um, if not all of it, is going to be written with a slant towards misogyny just because it was a misogynistic time period. Um, But that's, you know, that doesn't mean that it's not worth studying and that these women aren't worth trying to recover. I think if anything, it means that it's exciting work, it's necessary work. um, And it's, to me, very, very fun. I, again, completely agree with you. It's what's kept me going since, wow, 2009 now, I think, is when I yeah. started my website. So it, it is, it's exciting. And it's that that um, sort of detective work that comes into play as well that I find completely addictive. Um, and I know you you feel like Anne Boleyn, how I feel about Elizabeth Woodville, that there is so much to be said about those two women and so many similarities be- between the two of them, which Anne Boleyn you know, like so many of us, that's who sucked me uh, into history. That's who got me interested. And then, you know, I worked my way back um, to Elizabeth Woodville from her and just the parallel lines that can be drawn between the two of them. And just trying to think about like, you know, what these women were actually like and what we're told um, they were like in a very hostile um, environment that, you know, these people were writing about them. It's, it just... I think it helps bring them to life uh, that much more. You know, neither of them were perfect, uh, which I think makes them even more interesting to read about and learn about and write about. Um, But that's, you know, that's the case for so many of these women. I don't think they have to be queens or have become queens to make them, you know, worthwhile to learn about. I just, I feel like we can learn a lot uh, from the women in medieval and Tudor history that is so applicable to us today. And that, to me, that's, you know, the magic of it. It sure is. And creating, as you said, those fuller portraits of these women, I think is so important. 
because they were very complex and layered women, especially if we're talking about someone like Anne Boleyn. So, oh, Lacey, this has been such a fascinating and insightful discussion. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on and speak with us. Oh, thank you, Natalie. And anytime you want to talk about the princess in the tower, oh, yeah. I'm here for it. <laughs> okay, we're going to book that one in next. Thank you so okay. much, Lacey. <laughs> Thanks, Natalie. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind-the-scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re-enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon.